It's hard work. You're just thinking about your breathing, putting your foot in the right place, breathing, putting your other foot down. And often where you put your foot can determine whether you live or die. When you're roped with someone on a high mountain, your lives are linked. If one of you falls, you could both fall to your death. So you really have to trust the person, you have to work together, and, and you're risking your life for a goal that's important to you. And I feel that way in the work I'm doing right now in science with the team of people I work with. You know, we're all really working hard, focused on a common goal, and now it's not our lives, but it's really the health of all the creatures on the planet because we really need not to have all these highly toxic chemicals in our bodies, wildlife, the environment. Arlene's been doing absolutely critical work on getting toxics out of our day-to-day -day lives. What's wonderful about Arlene is it takes huge persistence and dedication to climb a mountain. She has brought that kind of commitment to the work of getting toxics out of our environment. And that is an amazing and wonderful gift. I grew up in Chicago, Illinois, and I was raised by my grandparents and my mom and um, kind of grew up with not the most positive messages. So I remember when I was really young, overhearing a couple of my aunts say I would probably amount to no good, and that's always been something that's been hard for me to get over. I wanted to go far from Chicago and was really lucky to get a scholarship to Reed College. And my freshman chemistry professor was this amazing young woman, and she thought chemistry was the most exciting subject on the planet. And there were four girls in my freshman chemistry class, and they all got PhDs in chemistry which says something about the importance of role models. I mean, that was the 60s and not that usual for women to get PhDs in chemistry. So it was really inspirational. As luck would have it, my lab partner was this handsome young man from Portland. And we studied chemistry till late one starry night. And he said, do you want to climb Mount Hood? And he was very handsome, so I said, sure. He put a big heavy pack on my back and I started gasping for breath and he later said he didn't think we'd make it out of the parking lot. I kept gasping and continued upward and the sun rose. We were on a glacier. It was the most beautiful place I'd ever been in my life and I fell in love with him and with mountain climbing and with chemistry. I started climbing increasingly challenging mountains, and I was on a mountain in India with a young man, Bruce Carson, who was perhaps America's leading young rock climber. He had pioneered climbing the big cliffs in Yosemite free without pitons. And so we were on this easy high mountain and um, reached the summit. He was a bit ahead, and when I got to the summit, he wasn't there. And he had walked on a cornice. That's where the snow blows over a rock face, and he had stepped on the cornice and fallen to his death down the rock face. I wanted to do something in his memory, and he'd been an early environmentalist. I heard of a test to determine if chemicals are likely to cause cancer based on whether they change the D DNA in bacteria. So I went to see the professor, Bruce Ames, mm -hmm. who had devised the test, and I said, is there something I can do to help the world? And he said, well, why don't you look at the flame retardant in the kids' pajamas? We found a little girl who never worn Tris treated pajamas, and after one night of wearing them, we found Tris breakdown products in her urine. So that meant this flame retardant was going from the pajamas into the child. So in the 70s, we wrote a, an article in Science Magazine saying that the flame retardant kids' pajamas could be cancer-causing and shouldn't be used, and three months later it was removed from Kit's pajamas. Arlene takes setbacks and she turns them into meaning whenever she can. And that desire to make the world a better place, a fairer place, a place where everyone can do well, it's deep in her heart. Arlene's always wanted to make a difference. And you know, she started by being the first leader of a women's 
group of mountaineers to go up a world-class mountain. I'd been climbing for a few years. I heard about an expedition to Denali, the highest mountain in North America, and I applied. And the brochure came and it said that women could go as far as base camp and help with the cooking. So I called the leader and I said, well, I've actually climbed higher than Denali. And he said, well, were you with men? And I said, yeah, I was the only woman, but I think I did my share. And he said, women aren't physically strong enough or emotionally stable enough to climb high mountains, like it was a fact. So then I thought, I wonder if a team of all women could climb Denali. And I really didn't know the answer. And it was like a great adventure. And I just started asking every woman climber I could find. And I found five others. And so it was a great adventure. I took a long break from science. Reagan became elected and um, just the way solar was taken down from the roof of the White House. Uh, scientists studying toxic chemicals were not being funded. And so I decided to take off and walk across the Himalayas and have other adventures for four years. And as we know, it was a long time. And suddenly it was 26 years later. I'd raised my daughter who was just starting college. I'd written my book, Breaking Trail, and I wanted to go back to science. So I went to a green chemistry meeting in, here in Oakland, and uh, there was one industry guy there from the foam industry. So I introduced myself, and he said, what do you do? And I said, I used to work on flame retardants a long time ago. And he said, flame retardants, those are really important to us for the foam industry. We have to put them in all our foam for furniture. Now we're using Tris, and we're a little bit worried about it. And I said, that's what we got out of kids' pajamas in the 70s. And he said, no, no, it can't be but we checked and it was the same chemical. There's tens of millions of toxic couches in our homes. Those of us who can afford it can buy new couches, but then the old couches can end up with college students, the Goodwill, low-income communities. I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times. Russell Long from Friends of the Earth read it and came to me and said, let's write a bill to get flame retardants out of furniture. I thought, oh, okay, we'd write a bill, and a few months later it would pass, and the flame returns would be out of the furniture. So that was eight years ago. <laughs> and this eight years has been like climbing Annapurna for eight years. It's been like the biggest adventure of my life. But the good news is the flame returns are no longer needed in our furniture, and that's a huge change. I think what I've learned through my life because it all sounds good, but along the way there have been incredible difficulties and setbacks. And I had a full scholarship to college too, and a, a family who thought girls didn't need an education. I think it's to really figure out what you want, have a vision, and whether the vision is climbing Annapurna, or stopping toxic chemicals, or making your community healthier, but to get a vision of what you really want and then to find others who share this vision, and then to really believe in yourself. Because I have found in my life that repeatedly I've been able to do things that seemed absolutely impossible because of having a vision, sharing it, and then incredible persistence. You know, you just have to keep plodding up that mountain through storms and avalanches and yetis and whatever else. But I think all of us can achieve things we've never believed possible if we can really find our vision and believe in it.